those sheets that's being passed out by Mike McGill that deals with the collection that's taken up in class and how that money is used and so forth. If you didn't get one of those copies, would you mind raising your hand? We can get those to you. Mike, over here in the back corner. Okay, we're getting ready to start a class here, and I was just going to kid Jerry a little bit, but I can just ignore that first slide for right now. I had just a couple little things I wanted to say about Hebrews. If you closed out, didn't get those last two verses in. But it's just some little things, but uh, one of them I think is especially is important. Uh, verses 24 and 25, he says, Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, those from Italy, greet you. Uh, so he, he sends special greetings to the elders uh, of these people. And, and I think that is interesting. The only one time that I know of that Paul specifically greets the elders is in his letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. He includes greetings to the elders and deacons. Uh, but here he mentions, greet those who rule over you. And if you recall, he had talked earlier about how that these brethren needed to obey and submit to the elders. So evidently there were some uh, problems there. Some were not willing to submit to them, maybe. Uh, and, and so, you know, he's emphasized the importance of it. He's mentioned these men three times in this last chapter and concludes here by saying, greet those who rule over you. So uh, let's don't ignore those leaders, he says. You make sure uh, you greet them in my name and let them know. Uh, that, that, that the writer is concerned about them also and about what's going on. And then this is last little thing. Grace be with you all. Amen. Uh, I never paid much attention to this. I know the word grace, it's used a number of times in the New Testament. Uh, and, and the word grace simply means favor or undeserved or unmerited favor. But in all of the greetings, and it's in every one of Paul's letters, I went back to check every one of them. Uh, the word grace appears in every one of them at the end with the article, the grace. And, and according to uh, Brother Milligan, any time the article is used with grace, uh, it, it means uh, here in the New Testament, the special and peculiar favor of God to his children. That favor that supplies all that is good and frees them of all that is evil. And so God's grace has appeared to all men, but when it's used by Paul in reference to grace for God's children, he uses that article uh, to let them know this, this is especially an uh, you know, appeal for the grace of God to be with his people and providing them everything they need and, and ridding them of everything that's evil. Uh, and so we all stand in need of the grace of God, but to think that as God's children, uh, Paul has made a, a particular uh, request of God in that regard that his grace be with those who are his children to help us in this life and our endeavors to live for him faithfully. Now, I gained a great deal from the book of Hebrews. I've studied the book before. I've had classes in it in college. But this time, for some reason, it seemed like I benefited by it more than I ever have. And I certainly hope and pray you have. I know we spent a lot of time in that book. And uh, that can get kind of tiresome sometimes to people when they just stay so long in one book. But uh, hopefully you've uh, profited by that as much as I did. And, and I think the same thing now... For the book of James, as we begin looking at it, because James is a shorter book, but it's a great book. It has a lot of things to teach uh, those of us who are God's children. Uh, as we look at the book, though, I want to begin just by uh, giving a brief introduction to the book and talk some about that. First of all, in regard to the author of the book, uh, it, it's interesting that the book begins with the words, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, he lets us know in the very beginning who the author is. It's James. But there's a slight problem with that. The name James was a very popular name among the Hebrews. And there are at least three men of importance in the New Testament that have that name James. And so uh, we've got to understand who is this James that's being talked about. Uh, and like I said, there, there are three possibilities as who it can be. Uh, first of these is James, the son of Zebedee and Salome. These, this was one of the uh, uh, men that Christ had chosen to be an apostle. Uh, he is a, a brother of John. Uh, and these were two of the first men that Jesus 
called uh, to serve him and to chosen to be apostles. Uh, it's mentioned in Matthew 10 where he gives a list of the apostles. Verse 2 simply says the names of the twelve apostles were these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. So that's one of the James it's talked about. One who is a, uh, the father or the son of uh, Zebedee. He's the brother of John, and he's also an apostle. Uh, then there's James, the son of Alphaeus. And this man also uh, was chosen to be an apostle of Jesus. Staying there in Matthew chapter 10, you look at verse uh, 3. And it says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebanius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Uh, and then the third James mentioned is James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55. Statement is made, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers? James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So uh, that, that's given there in Matthew chapter 13. Now, by process of elimination, I think we can come to a conclusion as to which James is the one that wrote this book. Uh, first of all, I, I think we can... Uh, and eliminating, we can eliminate James, the son of Zebedee, because he was killed around 44 A.D. Uh, you read about that account given in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, that mentions the fact that it's about the time that, that Herod stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, and, and verse 2 tells us that he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. So this, as I said, we can't pinpoint exactly, you know, but, but around A.D. 44. It may have been a year or two before or after that, but uh, somewhere in that area. But the book of James itself, and again, we can't pinpoint exactly when it was written, uh, but somewhere usually in the early to mid-60s that this book was written. And so by elimination, that cannot be James, the son of Zebedee, that wrote this book, because he would have died several years before the book was written. And so we can eliminate him. Uh, the only ones who have seriously considered James the son of Alphaeus are the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox churches. And uh, they have a, a, a reason for wanting it to be James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, and uh, one of the things is, you know, you look at these four men, James, Joseph, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, uh, they claim were cousins of Jesus, not brothers of Jesus. Now, why would they want to say that, that these are cousins and not brothers of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, they believe that Mary continued to be a virgin and she never had any other children. And so, lo and behold, you've got these four men. If they're brothers, then that, that destroys their, their belief and what they teach. And by the way, that's a doctrine uh, in the Catholic Church, it came some 100, 200, 300 years after uh, the time of Christ that they, they developed this doctrine. And so they don't want to say brothers, they want to say cousins. But the thing is, the text calls them brothers. The, the word is adelphos in, in the Greek, and it's a word that simply means brothers. It never means cousin. Uh, there is a word for cousin that's used in the New Testament. Uh, and so if it was talking about the cousins of Jesus, why wouldn't they have used that word? Uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, for instance. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So uh, there is that word that's used uh, in the Greek that means cousin. They could have used that. If they meant to say that these four people are cousins of Jesus and not brothers of Jesus. And so, you know, that, that idea is brought out. that They, they oppose the idea of, of believing that Mary had other sons. And so they want to deny that. Uh, one other possibility. Some have suggested that these four brothers of Jesus were sons of Joseph by a previous marriage. Uh, Despite the fact the Bible doesn't say anything at all, doesn't give any hint that Joseph had been married before he married uh, Mary. But 
they say, well, you know, this, this could be one way of explaining it and, and preserve their doctrine. Uh, but if that's the case, these four men would not be related to Jesus in any sense. Uh, they couldn't be related through Joseph because Joseph is not the actual fleshly father of Jesus. And it can't be related to him through Mary because according to that, according to them, Mary would not have been the mother of these four people. So he wouldn't be kin at all to Jesus. He wouldn't be a cousin or a brother. And so it, it destroys, you know, their, their belief in that regard. Uh, but there's another reason why it could not be James, the son of Alphaeus. And they believe that the James, that's the, uh, uh, the cousin of Jesus, is this James who's mentioned as being the son of Alphaeus. Why couldn't he be the one that, that wrote this book that's the... Uh, What's that? All right, someone turn to John chapter 7 and verse 5. I, I think I've got that on the screen here in a minute. but John chapter 7 and verse 5. Who's got that verse? Oh, Darnell, go ahead, please. We're not even his brothers believe in him. Okay. Uh, even Christ's brothers, they want to call them cousins, okay? Whoever, they did not believe in Jesus. Well, who is James, the son of Alphaeus? We just talked about. He is an apostle. Would Jesus have chosen someone that didn't believe in him to be an apostle, to be a leader in his church, when he's not even, couldn't even be a member? Uh, is not a follower of Christ? Well, no. He wouldn't have chosen a non-believer. And so it, it can't be uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, even if they could prove that, and they can't do that. They have to, you know, change the Bible up in some way to get that. You've got to make them cousins or make them sons of Joseph by another wife. And by the way, in, in doing that, in making them cousins, you know what they say? Here's the relationship. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a sister who was named Mary. And she's the one that had these four boys, and so that makes them cousins. Why do we give different names to our children? Yeah, it's to give them a unique identity. You know, uh, it's to identify them as someone different from the others. Except for that TV show with years ago... Uh, Bob Newhart, you know, and he had those three workmen there, and they introduced himself, this is my brother Daryl, my other brother Daryl, you know. Uh, well, that's meant to be a joke, and that's what it would be. You wouldn't name uh, two of your children, getting to give them the same name, and yet they have to believe that you've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her sister Mary, who's the mother of these other four boys. Uh, and so, you know, that that's what people go to sometimes at length in trying to to preserve uh, false doctrines that they have. Uh, so I believe that the James that we talked about here is James, the brother of Jesus, just by elimination. Uh, the other two would be eliminated. That would only leave James left, and so he would be the one, uh, I would uh, suppose, to be the one who's written the book. Now, consider who is he writing to here, uh, the audience. Uh, and, and the text says that the letter is addressed to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. And so then we have to determine, well, who are the 12 tribes that he's talking about? Uh, that's an expression that's used uh, a few times in the New Testament uh, to talk about the, the dispersion. Uh, but who are they? Uh, the Jews had been dispersed numerous times in history. Uh, you go back in the Old Testament, the, the 10 tribes of the north were captured by the Assyrians and were carried away into captivity. So they're dispersed. Then later, the southern kingdoms, the two tribes of Judah uh, and Benjamin, are captured by Babylon, and they're carried away into captivity. And even when the captivity ended, not all of them came back. Uh, and, and, and they have them scattered everywhere. And so, uh, who, who are the 12 tribes of the dispersion that he's talking about? Who in particular is he writing to? Uh, and just... Just as an aside about this, 
was a different time, and there are at least three different times, when God's people, the Jews, have been dispersed into different places around the world. Uh, and that was a punishment upon the people because they had not obeyed God, so they're carried away into captivity. But uh, it's also something God could use and did use uh, as, as a great blessing because when the church is established and Christians go out preaching the gospel, uh, for example, think about Paul. Where did Paul go first? Wherever, whatever city he went to, who did he go to first? To the Jews. Well, why would he go to the Jews first? Yeah, he, he, initially it was to the Jews only. But go to the Jews because these are people that believe in the same God you believe in. It's, it's not like the pagans who believe in all these different idols. So you've got somebody that believes in your God. You've got somebody that believes in the Old Testament law who are willing to listen to it. And so it's going to be easier to teach them and reach them with it. And, and wherever you go, you're going to find Jews. If there are not enough men gathered together to establish a synagogue, you can find like you did find uh, those Jewish women uh, who gathered together on the Sabbath day to pray. And so you can always you can find somebody to teach because of this dispersion that's been made of God's people. Uh, but anyway, just been, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, this term dispersion or diaspora in the Greek is used in reference to the uh, church, to spiritual Israel. Uh, they're called uh, the dispersion. Uh, then also they're found in John chapter 7 and verse 35, that word's found where it's used of the fleshly Jews. Uh, those who are Jews not being members of the church, but Jews who physically are Jews. They were born uh, as Jewish people. Uh, and so it's used in both ways. But here in James, again, I think by elimination, you conclude that it's written to those who are, who are Christians, to believers, whether Jews or Greek, uh, Jew or Gentiles that have become Christians, that he's writing to them. Uh, for example, uh, it was not written uh, uh, to unbelieving Jews. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, James says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Well, obviously, he's not writing to unbelieving Jews because he talks about having the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever he's writing to are people that believe in Christ. They've accepted him as Lord in their life. Uh, then, too, it could not be written to unbelieving Gentiles. Uh, again, that's found in, in the opening verse. James, the bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. If you're writing to non-believing Gentiles, you would not refer to them as the twelve tribes of dispersion. That's only used of the Jews who were scattered or of Christians who were scattered. So he's not writing to unbelieving uh, Gentiles. He's writing to those individuals who are believers in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, that he's writing to. And so that's who he's writing to in regard to this. Now, very quickly, just by way of introduction here, I want to talk about the purpose of the book. Uh, and this, this is important. And hopefully we'll notice this as we go through the book. The, the book seems to have been written primarily for the purpose of teaching the hearers more about the Christian faith and about being able to encourage them and helping protect them uh, from those temptations of the world. Because you're going to find in the book the things that he says, there are some problems in that regard that these, these brethren are hearing. Uh, very quickly, just, just look here uh, in James as we go through this. Uh, first of all, in James chapter 2 uh, and verse 2, uh, he shows that evidently uh, some in the church are showing respect to persons. He says, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should come in also a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, Sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. So they're showing partiality, showing favor to the person who's rich. Uh, 
and, and not showing any favoritism at all toward the one that's poor. And so that's one of the problems that he's going to have to deal with and try to, to correct. Uh, then look at verse, uh, verse 6. Someone read verse 6 for me, if you would, chapter 2. James 2 and verse 6. Okay, uh, th- there's this problem they have uh, of contempt they have toward the poor and the way they treat them. Uh, and, and he tells them, listen, you need to say, it's the rich people that are dragging you into court. And they're the ones that are causing you trouble. And yet, you show pleasure to them, but you show contempt for the poor uh, and, and doing that. Uh, then move over to chapter 3. Verses 8 through 10. He says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So there's some problems there in the church of those individuals uh, who speak evil. Uh, Words... Uh, blessings and cursing coming from the same mouths of them. Uh, then in chapter 4, in verse 11, he says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And so they've been guilty of judging one another. So there's some problems. And one of the reasons he's writing this book is try to help correct these things uh, and, and save these people from the problems and the trouble that are going to come upon them uh, when they're misbehaving in that way and treating others uh, incorrectly. And so that's the thing that he's concerned about. Then the last thing by way of introduction. And get that out of the way and then we'll be able to, to start in the book itself. Uh, uh, well, I need to point out this. The, James is called a book of practical Christianity. What does that mean? What, what is the practical Christianity? Uh, knock off the last two letters of practical and put an E on there and what have you got? Practice. And that's really what what he's talking about here. Uh, Practical Christianity has to do with action or practice in our lives. How we live it out in our lives. It's it's not so much, you know, what we think about it or theorizing about it. It's how we actually put it to use in our life. How we live it in our life. And that's what this book is all about. And and that's what makes it, uh, to me, such a valuable book. To those of us who are children of God, it's letting us know how we put these things into practice in our how we are to live Christianity, not just talk about it. Uh, and then also the fact that, that it's, well, I thought I'd put that up. It, it's also sometimes called the gospel of common sense. Uh, and it really is. Uh, one of the uh, synonyms for the word practical uh, is the word sensible uh, and so it's the gospel of sense it's the gospel of common sense and, and so in that sense it would suggest that this is something that anybody would be able to understand and, and they can accept that you know and just look at well yeah that makes sense that that's the way we behave that that's what we need to do and so it's a valuable book from that, that point in that and then the last thing the canonicity uh, by canonicity, which simply means, does this book belong with the other inspired books? Uh, the word canon is a transliteration of the Greek word. The Greek word is canon. And it simply means rule, R-U-L-E. And so, what, what books uh, are we to accept as the books by which we rule ourselves, by which we are obedient? And uh, there's, sadly, there, there's, there's some that 
that don't look favorably upon the book of James. They haven't completely rejected it. They haven't said this doesn't belong in the Bible, but they don't have a whole lot of respect for it. Uh, first of all, uh, there's uh, the belief that it should not be regarded as highly as other books of the Bible. You see, uh, we're not saying cut it out of the Bible, you know, keep it in the Bible, but don't regard the book of James as highly as you would other books. Now, Martin Luther was one of those that took this view. Uh, I've got a quote here from him. If you can read that, uh, he says, In fine, St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially those to the Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle, these are the books that show thee Christ and teach thee everything that is needful and blessed for thee to know, even though thou never see or hear any other book or doctrine. Therefore is St. James' epistle a right strawy epistle in comparison with them, for it has no gospel character to it. Now, according to Luther, you know, you, you accept the gospel, of course, but especially St. John's gospel, and John's first epistle that he wrote, uh, and then Paul's epistles, but especially, he says, Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and Peter's first epistle. Now, he said, you can take those books, and you can learn everything you need to know about being a Christian, about how you ought to live. Uh, and it, if you didn't have any other books but those books, if you didn't have any other doctrine being taught to you than what's taught in those books, that would be sufficient for you. You won't need these others. And that's why he says that, that St. James, uh, his book is a right strawy epistle. And by that, it's, it's weak. It doesn't contain, you know, what he calls here gospel character. And, and so it's weak. And that's why he and, and many others... Uh, put these books at the end of the Bible. Uh, James is put there along with uh, the book of Jude and, and Revelation. It's put at the end of the Bible. And, and in listing the books of the Bible, they don't list those books. They have them at the end of it as kind of a supplement. You know, Take these books, read these, study these, learn from them and obey them. And, you know, if you have time, you want to look and see what some other people think about it, here's some books that you can read that are supplementary to it. Uh, and, and that's because of that, that, it's caused a lot of doubt that people had. Now, why do you think Luther had such a hard time with the book of James? What's that? It doesn't teach faith only. He had problems with it talking about works. Uh, Luther was a, was a Catholic priest, uh, but he had his differences with the Catholic Church. Uh, so far as I know, he never left the Catholic Church. He was buried in his priestly robes. Uh, but he disputed with the Catholic Church their idea of salvation by works. Uh, and, and so he was opposed to that. Uh, he believed that salvation was by faith only. In fact, Luther's the one who in the book of Romans added the word only. When Paul talks about faith, I think in chapter 4, he adds it, so, so then you're saved by faith, you're, though you're saved by faith only. Well, you get to James, and James denies that. And so he has problems with that. And, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to just outright get rid of it, say it's, it's not an inspired book, it doesn't belong in the Bible. He'll put it in there, but like I said, it's more like a supplement. It's like in some translations when they're, uh, they don't include Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Uh, they don't include that. Uh, some of them will put it in a footnote. But putting it in a footnote, they're still denying that it really belongs in the Bible. And, and when he puts these books as a supplement, puts them at the end, it, it basically is saying, you know, the, these books aren't worthy of our consideration as being uh, of God. But it's because of the fact that he has problems with the idea of salvation by works. And, and that's been a problem to a lot of people. Uh, 
you know, you, you look at what James says, and, and there are people who believe that James is contradicting what Paul said. And, you know, you can't have contradictions in God's Word. God's Word doesn't contradict each other. And so one of these has got to be wrong. And so Luther says that's James. Uh, and, and there are other people today that have the same problems. And, and maybe we'll talk about that. I, I think they're wrong in that. There are no contradictions in what, between what Paul said and what James says. And we'll, we'll try to look at that more as we get into this. Uh, so uh, just, just look at the book itself and begin this. Uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, is the address and greetings. Uh, and this really is just, you know, separate from what the others are going to look at. But as, as you look at that, that first verse, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So just briefly to look at, at how he begins this. We mentioned James. All right, this is James, the Lord's brother. We don't know a whole lot about him. What do we know about James besides the fact that he, he is a brother of Jesus Christ? What about in Acts chapter 15? In Acts chapter 15, there's been a dispute. Uh, there, there are some Jewish Christians who are saying, these Gentiles can be brought into the church, but they're going to have to be circumcised. And, you know, keep the law of Moses in that regard, at least by being circumcised. And so Paul was saying, no, you don't have to be circumcised. So you've got these Judaizing teachers opposing what Paul said. And so it comes to the church there in, in uh, Jerusalem and to the apostles. But not all of them are there that are, that are speaking about this are apostles. One of them is mentioned is James, the Lord's brother. Uh... And evidently, he is a leader in the church at Jerusalem, which would tell me he's an elder in the church there. And he speaks up uh, in regard to this. And what he has to say is in agreement with what Paul is teaching. And so we know that he was a, a leader among God's people in the church there at Jerusalem. Uh, we don't even know much more about his life or, or about his death, although a lot of what has been said would suggest that, that he died as a martyr for Christ, that, that he died because of his faith uh, in, in Jesus as, as the Lord, as the Messiah. Uh, so when he writes to these people here, he describes himself as a bondservant of God. Now that's caused problems for people in, in not believing that this is James the Lord's brother. Because if you're the Lord's brother, wouldn't you tell the people? James, the brother of Jesus. Why wouldn't he do that? You know, we don't know for certain. It would all be speculation. But some people believe that it was because of the fact that he didn't want people to accept him and what he's saying just because he had a physical relationship with Christ, that he was a brother of Jesus. But he wants people to understand that as a leader among God's people, he is a man who has been inspired of God, evidently, and he has something to say. And they need to, to listen to him, not because of his physical relationship to Jesus as a brother, but because of his relationship to God as a bondservant of God. Uh, and really, that, that tells me a lot about it. And it. There are only two books in the Bible where the writer of the book introduces himself by name and by the title of bondservant. Now, Paul will, will introduce himself by name as a bondservant, but he'll also add in an apostle. But these are, there are only two that introduce themselves as a bondservant uh, and by name. James is one of them. Who's the other? Who would you think it might be? No, not Paul. Jude. The book of Jude. Why? Who is Jude? Jude's one of the brothers of James. Remember, there's four boys that are mentioned there. James. 
Joseph, and is mentioned uh, Judas or Jude. And so he is the one. He also introduces himself as Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So only two men do it. And they both happen to be men who are brothers of Jesus. And so it may be a, a real mark of humility here. Uh, not boasting about who they are in that regard. But their real humility is seen in how they do introduce themselves. Simply as bond servants. The word in the Greek is the word doulos. And sometimes it's translated, King James translates it most often as servant. Uh, others translate it as a bond servant. Some translate it slave. And, and in reality, the word slave best fits the meaning of the Greek word doulos. The only difference is that the doulos is a slave willingly. Someone who's chosen to be the slave of Christ. <clears throat> uh, normally when we think of the word slave, what do we think about? Think about forced enslavement. You know, you, you think about people who are captured and maybe put in chains and carried away from their homes uh, to some other place and they're sold to somebody and, and they have to serve them, but it's forceful, forced enslavement. They don't want to do that. They're, it's not their will to be there. They're forced to be there. But to be a slave of Christ is a decision that we make. We choose to be with Him. We choose to accept Him as the Lord and Master of us all, and, and therefore that we're going to serve Him faithfully uh, in that regard. And that's the whole address of it here when He calls Himself a bondservant uh, of, uh, of Christ, of God and of Christ. Uh, because that's the meaning there of the word. Now, two things that I read in regard to James in that regard. Uh, first of these comes from William Barclay. And he says, At the very, very beginning of his letter, James describes himself by the title, Wherein lies his only honor and his only glory. He describes himself as the slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a mark of humility. You're the brother of Jesus. Brag about that. Put that out there, who you are. No, no, no. I'm just a slave of God and of Jesus Christ. And then R.V.G. Tasker made this statement about it. He says, James, in sending greetings to his readers, is content to describe himself not by the title of any office he may be holding in the Christian church. And I believe he held the title of elder. He says, but very humbly by reference to his status as a Christian man. And calling himself a slave, a doulos, he, he's making no distinction between himself and those people he's writing to. He's no different uh, than, than any of us. Those of us who are Christians, we're slaves of Christ. We're doulos. And James says, I'm not special. I'm not better than you. I'm, the, I'm just a Christian man, just like you are. Uh, I, I'm a servant, a slave of Christ. But what does that mean? What basically does it mean to be a bondservant? And there are three things uh, that, that, that I've come across in regard to that word. Number one, being a doulos implies absolute obedience. Now, some people were made slaves and they obeyed absolutely because they were forced to. Uh, you know, they might be beaten severely to get them to do what their master wants them to do. But we choose to obey. And we have to understand that, that as slaves of Christ, we have got to absolutely obey Him. And then also it entitle and entails absolute humility. And you see that in, in James here. That he chooses to describe himself just as one of you, just a slave like you are. Uh, I'm not special. Yes, I'm the physical brother of Jesus, but no, I don't view myself in that way. I'm just a slave like anyone else. Humility. And then it means absolute loyalty. You know, Jesus had 
his betrayer. He had Judas who betrayed him. But to recognize Jesus as the master and ourselves as his slave means we've got to have absolute loyalty to him. Uh, nothing else. We're not going to leave that. But, and mention this and then we'll close out. There's also a certain pride in being known as a slave of God and of Christ. Not pride in an evil sense, but, but in a positive sense. Because looking to the Old Testament, over and over again, looking at how, how men refer to themselves and how God refers to them. Uh, in, in the English translation, for instance, uh, Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Jeremiah, and Amos, and others like them, either refer to themselves as servants of God, or God calls them my servant. And it's interesting, the, the word that's used, uh, and, and I know nothing about Hebrew, just what I can read in the, in the lexicons about it, that the word that's used there for servant is always used in connection with bondage. And so there's that idea of slavery. And so those men of the Old Testament, the great leaders of God's people, were slaves, bondservants, willingly of God. And when you get to the New Testament, you have the same thing there in regard to Peter and Paul and James and Jude. Uh, they see themselves as those who are, are slaves. And so for us to think about to be a slave of Christ, hey, I'm taking the same title that God gave to Moses, my servant, to the same given to James and others. Okay, it's 10 after, our time's over. We'll, we'll end at that and begin at this point next week. Still don't talk about, about Jesus there and, and what these titles of him suggest to us. All right, thank you very much.